Uh, Palila, we know historically, is just found at the higher elevations on Mauna Kea, Mauna Loa, on western Mauna Loa, and Hualalai. But bones of Palila have been found in coastal sites on Kauai and Oahu. They have not been found on Maui, which is kind of surprising. Uh, but, and it doesn't mean they weren't there. But a lot of bird bones have been found and discovered on Maui, and none of them so far have been Palila. So in efforts to conserve Palila, you have to keep in mind, well, this bird evolved with these upper elevations as part of their habitat, but they also had a lot of these very interesting lower coastal elevations that they lived in. And so are we going to be able to restore them there? Well, not likely because, you know, well, where would you, where would you do that? You know, the coastal areas are pretty, pretty well developed. Uh, and we don't really know what the, the coastal forest vegetation looked like even a few hundred years ago, much less maybe a thousand years ago. So um, one of the lessons is that <clears throat> where you find birds today is not necessarily the best place for them in an evolutionary sense. If you could get in your time machine and go back, you would say, well, maybe, maybe the best place for them is in these more coastal sites. Or maybe that was just uh, marginal habitat for them. We don't know. We do know that at the, the coastal site on Kauai, where palila bones have been found, there were no less than, I think, five or six, I think there were a total of seven birds that were somewhat similar to palila. Two, two were actually very close relatives, clearly, just based on the bones. Uh, and, and the rest were uh, seed-eating birds that had very heavy uh, beaks, you know, for crushing and extracting seeds. So there were a lot of seed-eating birds back, back then. Palila is the last of the uh, seed-eaters um, that we have today in the main islands. We, it, it, there are two close relatives, one on Laysan, one on Nihoa Island, the Nihoa and Laysan finches. And they're actually pretty close relatives of Palila. Uh, you can see similarities all the time, even in the way they, they feed. But they are different species. Anyway, I'm sorry, I, I digress easily. So um. I, I do want to get back to Palila yeah. uh, at, at some point this evening. Sure. Uh, there are a bunch of questions that I have about them. Sure. Uh, I don't know if you want to get into that right now or not. Any any time um, you want. Back when this lawsuit happened in sixty no seventy nine right seventy nine. Oh yeah okay. Um, there were, I believe they counted like thirteen or fourteen hundred birds at the time. I don't recall exactly what they. Well, they yeah. Had, but yeah, it was yeah, I'm, in I'm the not low good thousands. Numbers either. I, I have yeah. trouble with my age too. Um, yeah. But uh, the. The eradication started essentially in 1980. Mm -hmm. I know that in 1981, the population went from 1,300 to over 7,000. Around 6, around 6,000 is about as high as we figure they got uh, during, uh, you know, during the last 30 years. But, okay. But, yeah, you're in the ballpark. Um, and that was the year of the of the eradication so i mean there you could say oh this is great you know you get rid of a couple of yeah. sheep and well we got six thousand birds but then the following year it dropped to like thirty three hundred and then it, it dropped again to well, about it just dropped yeah it just dropped like a lead balloon right uh, and so i'm wondering and one we have a bunch of hunters here okay sure, so sure. You, you have to understand that uh, they don't agree that the sheep had a lot to do with what's going on yeah. with, with the palila and that there's a lot of other things that we should be doing maybe for the palila other than wiping off the sheep. And I want to get back to that future of the palila and the sheep sure. later and get your thoughts on that also later on. But um, but I've, I've watched this, I've graphed the palila. Palila has been of interest to me too. Mm -hmm. and, I've, and I've graphed this palila. I've actually tried to get... Uh, we have a gentleman here from Pohakaloa. That Pohakaloa is the only place that we have any um, data as to how much rainfall is collected, you know, on that side of the island. And mm -hmm. they're they're the only ones. There used to be sites all over the place, but there nobody's collecting them. Pohakaloa is all there was left. So up until just a few years ago, you're able to get quite a bit of data about the rain. 
and you try and look at the rainfall and the Palila numbers that, uh, you know, the census, and I'm curious, I want to ask you about how you do that too, but the, the census data that, that we have and the estimates of the, of the Palila that we have follow weather patterns, it seems like, not directly, but really close. And, uh, and that brings me back again to, you know, another question of, um, you know, the emphasis on this eradication, for example, uh, versus other ways of protecting the palila. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I'd like to get your, your thoughts on why do we have this, sure. I mean, wild fluctuations yeah. with the palila. Uh, it's stunning, actually. Well, um, let me begin by saying that um, it sounds like a simple task. Tell me how many palila there are. <clears throat> so, but if each of you individually had that task, you might approach it in different, somewhat different ways. But ultimately, you're going to go out in the field and you're going to be counting birds. But the question is, I mean, in any given day, you might see a dozen. You might count a dozen. You might count 20. But what is the population, really? And so therein, it's a very simple kind of concept. How many are there? And it's, it's the first question anybody ever asks of any endangered species. How many are there? And yet it is one of the most difficult to answer in any kind of credible way, simply because they don't line up for you and you count them, you know, one through. Like a yeah, it, it, it just doesn't happen. And so, um, and it, it's not my particular area of expertise, uh, but there are, there are people in also that work at our, our field station that that's mostly what they think about is how do we conduct credible surveys where there's really two things we want. One is we would love to know how many are there, and yet we know we'll never know exactly what that is just because the methods are, are simply too crude. It's just too hard. Um, and we'd also like to know, even if we don't know exactly how many there are, um, if we're consistent in our methods of doing the survey year to year, can we tell, are they going up, are they going flat, are they going down? I mean, that's really critical to know. And so my, my response is that I, I can never tell you how many birds there really are. I can tell you how many we estimate, and I have to bring in our statistician to, <laughs> to, to go into great detail as to here's how we generate the numbers. But, you know, just to walk through a scenario. We're going to do a Palila count right now. Where I'm sitting is a station, and 150 meters down, down that way is another station, and so on, every 150 meters. We're going to stop right here, and we're going to set our timer for six minutes. I'm just going to be listening, and I'm going to be watching, and I'm going to be you know, turning around and trying to see what I can see. And I'm going to be noting every Palila that I detect, and for that matter, every other Amakihi, Alapaya, what, what have you. I'm recording every bird that I can. So right away, you can say, well, that sounds good, but obviously, how do you keep from double counting? How, you know, a bird is flying around, it's moving. A bird is calling, you can't even see it, but you, you know it's a palila. Well, okay, that's the first level of complications is you never know. So you, the best you can do is you train people to detect birds at a high level of accuracy. And more importantly, you get them together before you do the count and you calibrate. And you say, okay, we're gonna do a, a count, a silent count. Everybody do their six minute count. We're all standing right here. And then we compare notes and say, oh, Tom, uh, you counted six palila. Um, the rest of us only got two. So you may be correct with your six, but you know, it's kind of a herd mentality. It's like, well, we're all really just saying two because we think they were moving around, you know, or whatever. Well, that, that was one question uh, on, on the, the method that you do yeah. this. It's, do you do this over a period of days, like a week in the same transects? Yeah, the way we do it is um, usually it's two people that go out. Usually we're training uh, a person. I mean, you, you have one experienced person usually teamed up with a less experienced person and they both do the count. But it's mostly, you know, for the secondary person, it's, it's just more training and building 
uh, confidence in, in their abilities. Um, so we will go out um, roughly at dawn and proceed until about 11 o'clock in the, in the morning. Uh, typically, an individual will do uh, anywhere from 12 to 15 of these stations, six minutes, of, you know, six minutes duration, and then just walking in between the, the stations. Um, and then that transect will be done again, probably the next day, by a different person, a different team, and then we will we'll pool those results. And it may be, you know, the, usually they're pretty close, but on any, on ev any given station, it's, it's not unusual that my, oh, we got three Palila yesterday, none today. Well, okay, you know, but so one and a half Palila for that station for this, for this annual survey. Um, <clears throat> and so I don't expect anyone to really believe me if I say, well, in 2003, we think we had about 6,000 Palila. I'm happy if they think, well, you know, he's in the ballpark because we don't, you know, we don't have any greater confidence in the actual number, the precision of the number than that. Although the statisticians would probably give me a jab in the ribs right now because they'd say, you know what, you know, we, we, got, we got very robust methods, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I think it's as good a system as we can do at this point. We're using the human brain, which at least for now is better than any digital device. Although I think maybe in 20, maybe less than 20 years, my prediction is that a lot of these surveys are gonna be done by digital recorders that are just out there all the time recording and then running through programs to identify different species and even individuals. But that's, you know, I'll, I'll, for, I'll be retired by that point. And, Tom, Teresa, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, okay, um, could you answer me, um, what are the factors involved in the declining of the bird population? And if there are factors, did you have to prioritize those factors that could be causing the declining of these uh, very species of Hawaiian birds? Yeah, um, that's, that's a very key question is, you know, okay, it's one thing to document or believe that populations are getting smaller. It's another to understand why. And it's really quite complex. Um, and it kind of depends on what sort of person you are. If you are the kind of person who likes a single answer to a question, then a lot of people, if you tell them avian malaria, They'll say, okay, well, that's good. I, that, that's enough of an answer. <clears throat> and, and, and that's an important factor. Um, but if you're the kind of person that says, well, you know, simple answers are all right, but I, I'm more interested in the, a more complex picture because I know real life is more messy than just single answers. <clears throat> well, it, it's, maybe I can um, help you along here. In the areas that you've done your count, in the areas that have been fenced off, in a control setting that you have up in the mountain area at the elevations that they are, in a natural setting, have you folks pinpoint what could be the declining factors? Well, um, yeah, we do, but they change from year to year, at least we think they do. Uh, in some years, uh, let's say a drought year, there's no question that the drought is a really important factor. Um, very few palila breed during drought, and that, the reason for that is uh, individual mamani trees produce relatively few flowers and rel relatively few pods. There's always a few. Even in the worst drought, there's always a few flowers and a few pods, but it's really not enough to support a population or support breeding. The palila really requires um, a lot of mamani seeds. They, they eat other things too, but mamani is their number one. And during drought, we've, we're, we're quite satisfied that the relationship between rainfall and the number of mamani pods produced is, is pretty good. The less rain, the less mamani pods. So that's, that's a really important one during dry years. During normal or you know, wetter years, <clears throat> other things can be important. 
uh, including predation. I mean, what we're thinking, what, what we're talking about now is what is affecting the, the population right now, or you know, this breeding season or this year. So drought, you know, weather conditions, predators, those things have an immediate or a fairly immediate uh, kind of impact. But there are also longer term issues. Excuse me, when you, when you speak of predators, could you name oh. the predators? Of course. Um, mostly on Mauna Kea, it's feral cats. Um, there, there are rats up there, and I think that they have an impact, but um, we've never really been able to demonstrate that they have as big an impact as the cats do. For example, um, the cats, um, during the time we were studying, we, we would put surveillance cameras at nests, and we'd also just physically go and check nests every few days. Um, <clears throat> but the cameras caught, um, I think four, there were four instances, if I recall right, of cats on camera killing palila chicks during daylight, not even at night. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, so th th that amounted to about 10% of all palila chicks uh, in that year being eaten by cats. Now, I don't think that necessarily happens every year, but that, you know, we were able to document that. So we, we believe cats are an important predator. Um, mongoose, we thought, might have gotten uh, one nest, but we weren't, we, it wasn't a, a nest with a camera, so we're not positive about that. And we think rats probably do occasionally get, get uh, Palila, and, but we just never were able to get great documentation of that, either with rat droppings or anything like that. And also, um, we, we, we don't want to forget that uh, Palila have native predators too, the, the pueo. The pueo will hit nests with chicks. Um, it's hard to document because they're very, very fast. We had uh, one person in a blind one day, and he said he, he just uh, was looking down for a moment, and when he looked up, he, this pueo was just sort of flying away from the nest, and it had, it had taken the chick. So, um, I mean, so there, there are predators, there, there are threats. Um, I'd say, you know, going back to weather, um, probably the single biggest factor in, in destroying palila nests can be just these big mountain storms. You just get a big rainstorm or may, maybe even hail. And you go out the next day and many, many nests have failed because they just, the chicks got too cold and, or the eggs got too cold and wet. But the birds... So, it come, oh, sorry, so, go ahead. so I, I come to my question now with all these previous efforts of fencing an area to protect the palila bird. Has the fencing method work? No. Um, the fence doesn't have any short-term impact whatsoever. I mean, it, it's, it, so we've been talking about short-term threats, and, and, and we have not been talking about the longer-term threats or the medium-term threats. And so it's simply too early uh, to say what impact the fencing has had or will have. What we do know is that um, especially based on um, uh, studies by Paul Scowcroft of the Forest Service, he measured growth rates of mamani and he said, well, it takes about 25 years for a mamani to be, uh, become, to grow to, um, I think it's a four meter height. Um, and that's about the height that is valuable to Palila. In other words, a small mamani, you know, maybe a meter or even two meters high, it has some value. I mean, the birds use it a little bit, but what we found is the birds really use the much larger, you know, the big trees. The bigger the tree overall, the more valuable it is to Palila. And we've got a very slow growing tree in a, in a, uh, a fairly harsh environment where yeah, it's just going to take decades and decades for these uh, resources to become really very valuable. I mean, they become incrementally valuable every few years as they grow. But, you know, the value is diminished in any given year, maybe by drought, if it's, if it's a bad, dry year. Well, the tree's not going to produce very many flowers or, or uh, fruit uh, pods. So the value of that tree in that period of time is low for Palila because 
there's really not much food on it. There might be some caterpillars, which are important. I, I want to ask you one question about sheep. I'm going to talk about sheep later on, but I, I do have one question. Do, do you remember Todd Lum? Of course, yeah. Um, Todd was kind of interested in the Palila as well. Yeah, yep, and one of the things that he told us was that the sheep were, in his opinion, were a impact on very small Momani trees. Mm -hmm. But once the Momani got to be about, and you talk about meters, you know, everybody else uses feet and inches. Yeah, but sorry. Uh, when, you, when you talk about a two meter tree, he said from two meters on up, you know, it just essentially, the browsing of, well, in the mouflon is what he was basically talking about, right. wasn't as serious a threat to the tree as it certainly was to younger trees. Right. And do you agree with that? Oh, yeah, that's quite right. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, we, <clears throat> we, we, we've thought about the tree size issue quite a bit. Um, you know, if you're a, a six, seven, eight meter high tree, browsing is only getting your, your very lowest branches. In fact, you, you won't have any lower branches because they're browsed off. If you're a one meter tree, chances are, I mean, you could be completely eaten up, you know, eaten up. It, that's not always the case, but potentially you can be. So there's a huge difference. If you're a big tree, the impact is way different than if you're a little tree. Um, and the, the vegetation work that, uh, studies that we've done up there show that um, the average size uh, to height of Mamani, or at least w when we did the, the work in two, uh, 2001, was about four meters. So you know, it just depends on um, how high the, the mouflon can get on that particular tree. But on average, probably only a quarter to a third of, the, of a tree that size is available to a mouflon, to a, to a browser that can reach up. Um, so, you know, you can kind of just do the, the calculation. All right, you... You, you, the tree is producing mamani flowers and pods all the way down to ground level. The, the branches that I've seen growing on the ground, I've actually even seen palila foraging essentially on the ground, I mean on branches that are on the ground or just inches off the ground feeding. So they use the whole tree. And so the question is, you know, strictly from a palila point of view, um, you can, if, if the average height of the, of the mamani trees are about four meters. And let's just say for convenience that the browsing is removing that first meter of, of branches. That's about a quarter of the total volume of, of food that is available to Palila. Well, um, you know, uh, that's just what it is. Well, uh, I, I have a question, yeah. Nani. Uh, without the grazers, the grass grows. It does. So um, grass can get thick and it can sm smother the small mamani. It can, yep. And it, then of course the fire fuel. There's fire fuel in the grass. I mean, <clears throat> when we were doing our um, vegetation analysis up there, we, you know, we saw lots of grass even in areas where there were still lots of mouflon at the time. There's a you know, I, I don't know what the threshold is. How many sheep would it take um, to, to graze the habitat to the point where you, you don't have high fuel buildup of grass, but you still have good, luxurious mamani for palila? I'm not sure that that, that threshold could be found. Right. Of course, that's what we're interested in is yeah. can there be a, a population of game animals, mm -hmm. grazers, mouflon, right. sheep? That, that could exist, coexist, and actually be beneficial. And one other question, I, I remember hearing it being said that um, the palila would um, uh, pluck or pick from the ground um, sheep hair mm, and uh -huh. put it in their nests. Right. And then, of course, when the sheep eradicated, they no longer could keep their babies warm that way. Is that true? It's true that they use wool. Um, and I guess if it were... If, if that were an important issue, that would be an easy one to solve because 
with or without sheep, we could simply go distribute wool around and birds would, you know, they'll use it. Um, they'll, they'll use all kinds of things. I mean, the, the nesting material is uh, usually sticks with grass lining and, and rootlets and things like that. And it's a very fine thing. And then the, the last thing they put in their nest is lichen, right. usually. I, right. I just wondered, how, after a time, you know, there yeah. was, especially with the Hawaiian black sheep, mm -hmm. they had z existed up there a lot longer than the mouflon. Yeah. Um, maybe there was a, a co, you know, thing going on. The birds right? will, you know, they, sure, they'll use wool. They'll use horsehair. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, we've found... Uh, other benefits, too. Oh, sure. That possibly a population of sheep could have coexisted, could have continued well, coexisting. Well, I mean, a population of sheep actually did coexist with Palila. Yeah. I, I mean, that's what happened. Sure, must have. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I think in the short term, that becomes uh, a much more feasible kind of population uh, 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 proposition. Yeah, so well, if you they, said, yeah. let's have sheep for one year, you know, it's kind of ridiculous, but let's have sheep for a very short period of time. Manage. Well, yeah, the Take impact, yeah, the impact wouldn't be nearly as much as if you said, well, let's have them up there for centuries. You know, that, it's it's just yeah. a time scale kind of issue. But that would be, I think, a really fair um, research. Oh well, I mean, I don't think I could get funding for it. Frankly, well, that's but. always the problem. <laughs> but you know, it would be more of a fair thing to the history of hunting. And I had one well. other question before I forget. Um, I, I also heard um, word, grapevine, that um, the helicopters eradicating the sheep um, and mouflon and what, whatever there was, <coughs> right, did they cause, a, they came pretty low and they would cause a lot of turbulence. Uh -huh. The mamani would be blowing and the palila nests would be in distress. Do you think right. that could have caused some nest abandonment, the eradication process? Oh, I think hypothetically, of course, sure. I mean, there's lots of things. Um, no well, document on that. I, well, I, have, I, don't I have, have a question on that, yeah, too. Sure, and sure. National Park Service did a study, 84, 85, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. They actually named Palakaloa, and no offense to my friend there, but <laughs> um, as a reason for the lower level of Mauna Kea being devoid of uh, Palila because of the noise of the helicopters. And they also cited up the national park uh, situations where uh, the helicopters were causing birds to leave their nests and at the national park. And so the National Park Service mm -hmm. made a recommendation uh, that they don't want to have helicopters around sure. uh, these birds. And in specifically in Palila, they were talking about the military and the, the impact of uh, the helicopter you know, area there. So I'm just curious, um, and not that I, because there's helicopters that have been out, you know, for 30, 40 years, actually, sure. I mean, all the time. And now you have tour helicopters that are coming through there uh, all the time. And as Nani is saying, you know, when you hover, uh, when you're looking for sheep and you're getting over these trees, uh, you are just blowing them to sure. smithereens. And I wouldn't want to be a, uh, I was, when I was my first bear hunt was in a was during Iniki. I mean, sorry, not Iniki. That what was that one in Eva? the big one in the mainland? In the main Eva. No, no, in oh. the mainland. Oh, on um, the main the one that they gave Bush all that grief for. Oh, 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 oh uh, uh, Katrina. <laughs> Katrina. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was sitting in a tree stand <laughs> during oh, Katrina. Right. I I wouldn't <laughs> want to be a bully. I'll tell you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In a in a windstorm. Um, well, I, I think there's almost unlimited ways to disturb Palila. I mean, you could do it any number of ways. And really, the, it, it, at least in my mind, it boils down to, is a disturbance worth the, the potential gain? You know, and that's the question the managers have to address. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's a fair question. It's just that, well, yeah. So, um, Paul, yes, I have a question. Yeah. So, in terms of policy, mm -hmm as it relates to this area. Who is really managing it? I should make clear that as, as, um, as a biologist with U.S. Geological Survey, we, we don't have anything to do with policy. We, we do advise policy makers, decision makers. If they ask us, what do you think 
is bothering Palil or what should we do, we'll okay. say. So, so what I'm kind of gathering now is that you don't manage it. Mm -hmm. Who does? Because right now, we have an eradication program going on. Right. So if you guys are not the bad guys who made that decision to, I, and I understand the courts were involved, but, sure, sure. but you've been doing your study now for, what, 20 years? Yeah, 25. So in that 25 years, who's, who's making policy and managing the area? The only answer I really have is the state and the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, have regulatory authority over Palila as an endangered species. And whatever they do, you know, they are the policy makers and implementers. Well, isn't Earth Justice a big part of that policy? Well, um, I wouldn't say they're part of the policy. I mean, they, they, have, a, they have the legal reach, of course, and they... Um, I mean, Every time you, know, you try to do something, they'll sue. That's, well, that, that's one of the I things mean, that we've, we've recognized. I mean, they affect policy... Certainly, yeah. Which, which brings me, and I don't want to get into it right this second, but I brought up a great question. But I do want to come back to a, a question that Nani sort of brought mm -hmm. up yeah, uh, sure. as we as we move along here in the, in the evening. But um, I, I'm going to give this back to Ike because I agree. I agree with Ike. You know, who who is right. the, the policy? You know, who is working with the public on on that as well? Right. Because uh, one of the things, you know, conservation biology or ecosystem <laughs> management or whatever. Um, really should be in, in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is charged. Their responsibility is to deal with the public. And now they might use the excuse of dealing with the public, you know, being, you know, talking to one of their partnerships or whatever it might be. Um, but, and they keep saying every time, and we got into this recently also as well, and I'm not looking at you for this. I'm just, um, you know, this idea of no significant impact, um, this Fonzi thing. Um, really doesn't wash well with, with the public, especially when the public hasn't been included mm -hmm. in decisions uh, that are made. And, or if they make decisions, they're ignored. And, and, I, and I think that a big part of this is, you know, uh, the foundation part of Ike's problem, and, or not problem, but question. And, uh, and that, that is something that interests everybody um, that we have to answer to. Yeah. yeah. No, I appreciate the problem. The issue here is you're speaking to a researcher who actually by, um, uh, I, I, I'm mandated not, I, I'm not allowed to advocate or uh, I can, it, it's even a gray area, can I suggest policy? All I can do if a manager wants my opinion is say, well, if you do this, I think this might happen. If you do that, I think that might happen, but the choice is, is really up to you to, to weigh. So, um, yeah, I mean, but I appreciate, you know, what, what you're trying to get at is just that uh, I, 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 can't, I can't satisfy that. Well, well getting back to that statement mm -hmm. that you just made, if we wanted your opinion, what avenue would we go to, to to be able to get that opinion from you? Well, you just ask me. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I can I can give you an opinion if I if I think I'm qualified. You know, I'll give you an opinion on what I think is good for Palila or bad for Palila. Or, and but there's a lot I wouldn't know. I mean, I, there's just many unknowns. Well, then, uh, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I'm just saying that you know, if you're open to an opinion, sure, you're giving an opinion. Sure. Um, there are several of us, and uh, and there are some people with the uh, department um, mm -hmm. here in uh, DLNR that would be very interested in sitting down with you and getting your your opinion on what it would take to safely reintroduce sheep up there, and what would it take mm -hmm. to manage those sheep, and what numbers of sheep, yeah. in your opinion. Yeah. Would, would be safe, and yeah. what could we do to protect those trees that are growing right now, the smaller ones especially, those that are two or three mm -hmm. meters? Um, you know, what can we do to keep the sheep away from them yeah. and until they get a bit large enough that, you know, a little more of a, of a browsing isn't going to be an effect to them? Right. So that, and if you're open to that, uh, we would like to get back to you on that. Yeah. Well, um, that would be a difficult thing for me to do because 
for me to give you an opinion, I have to have some kind of data. I mean, I, I, could, I could sort of say, well, we could test this idea and we can test that idea and, and so forth, but um, that's about as far as I could go. I, I couldn't really say, well, I think you could have you know, some number and that would be about right because there's absolutely no way. I, I would have no credibility if I told you that. You'd say, well, he just made up a number. I mean, or if you, if you didn't Excuse think that, me. somebody else would. <laughs> Excuse me, Teresa and Kona. Paula, I'd like to ask you, over these 25 years that you've been doing research, has the other agency come to you for your opinion? Uh, yes, they have. And, I mean, it's, it's been... And so, oh, sorry. Yeah, and so if these agencies have come to you for their opinion, then we can come to you for your opinion also? Well, of course, yeah. Um, but as I say... Um, my opinion, um, we, have to, we have to come to an understanding of what my opinion is going to be based on. I, I, I can't give you just my personal opinion as, as a sort of a hunch. I mean, I, I'm constrained to give you an opinion based on some research, um, you know, or, or simply say, well... So, so Paul, you know, mm -hmm. if somehow there were funding for mm. research on the impact of the sheep mm -hmm. or ungulates on the palila, then a study could be conducted to, to do that. Somebody probably would be willing to do that study, but I would point out huh? that most people who are going to be funding things, at least uh, on the government side, I mean, that, you know, most of my funding comes from government, sources um oh, <laughs> yeah i mean there are private sources of money for endangered species research but generally it's public funding um people are going to say well what research has already happened and so i mean the first thing that would would occur in any research project is let's look at what has happened so they go to paul schoolcroft's research and they say well you know here's john giffen's research and here's here's what we know you know, from those time periods and under those circumstances. And then they would maybe build on that. So it's, it's I guess I would, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I don't think it's an unexplored issue. It may not be th as thoroughly explored as you might wish or as, you know, be careful about uh, encouraging a research to do more because that's what we love to, we love to do more research. And we always have un unanswered questions. Um, so you have to be a little careful about who you ask. But um, So you're telling me to go study the existing stuff first. I would, I would examine that. And then when you s if you see deficiencies in that, if you think it's not, you know, if, if it's inadequate, um, then, you know, that, that's something that maybe somebody could address and say, oh, okay, uh, that study did such and such, but mm -hmm. now we have, you know, we have other other ideas <coughs> that could be explored. So I, I have a related question here. Sure. As it relates to uh, endangered species, th there always comes a point, especially with uh, vertebrates, that there is discussion about whether you do, you leave the, the organism in, in the habitat or remove it from the habitat. That's right. So who makes that decision? At least in the U.S., that would be U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, is ultimately, they, they are the entity that somebody's going to sue, either because they don't want that endangered species on their land or, you know, or they do. They want to, you know, they want to see recovery. So that is, that is the, the agency that gets sued. And the state can be folded into that because, in mo at least here, they have uh, also responsibility for endangered species. So the guys that get sued are the guys that uh, are, you know, going to so, make these decisions. So these are the guys that take the, the um, results of research and then that's right. based on that they make a decision. That's exactly right, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I got something for say. We've been listening to you for like almost an hour. Yeah. 
And in the beginning, I, I heard everything else but the sheep. And it seems to me now the state looks at it, that little report from what you guys saying about that tree growing so many whatever meters, that, hey, look, funding sheep, eradicate state. You know what I'm saying? I mean, but they don't look at the whole aspect of, okay, Poakaloa, bombing, you know, all that other research you did for 25 years. They're looking at that small fraction that they're saying, oh, they mentioned sheep. So they get on state funding, government again, right? So, I mean, we can go back and forth on this, and I appreciate all your research and stuff. And the same way you love doing what you do, a lot of hunters, they, they love what they're doing, and it's not a generational thing like your dad. Sure. And the, the, the thing, you know, in a nutshell is, why is it the sheep getting cracks on this? It's because the state, seeing what you and research, that small little fraction of it, they're not going to attack Puaka law, federal government, right? So, so to me, it's like, why are we going through all these scenarios? I mean, why? I mean, how can you help by say, just being honest and saying, hey, wait a minute, only 5% of it is sheep. Everything else is more. Well, that's, I think that's the data I'm looking for. I, I'm looking right. at what weighs more. Well, is uh, it Puakaloa bombing? Yeah. 50%, 25% versus sheep, 5%. But sheep is the one stay elevated to number one priority to eradicate. You know what I'm saying? So sure. that's the data, actually, I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the, the issue for me is that I, I think sheep are really, really important. I just don't think they're really important in a very short period of time. I think they're very important in the long, in the long haul. I think they've had very major impacts on the habitat. So, I mean, that, that's, what I, that's my reading of the history. But I think more to your point is <clears throat> the issue was decided back in 79 based on studies that were done before I became involved in it whatsoever. Um, and the sheep, you know, it was it was a big it was a big deal. Um, so I mean, the issue was 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 settled back then legally in in, in that sense. Well, and, and I thank you for that. And that's why I'm saying, back in the day, like how mm -hmm. your dad and everybody else was doing them. Yeah, I can I can understand that. But the the fact is, this is how long this been going on. So your data comes to one thing of hailstorms, droughts, and everything else. So it's a more up to date. Mm -hmm. See, yeah, yeah. Sure. Before days, we had cell phones that you had to plug in and only a certain few get. Yeah. Now everybody's in touch with the world. That's right. So your data is more up to date than what we're going to fall back 1970s. Because well, 1970s, we never even have cell phones. Yeah. So what I'm looking at is an up to date data that yeah. can, st can stipulate that, hey, wait a minute. We have you, Paul, mm -hmm. that has an up to date data stipulating that these are not the reasons. Yeah. That sheep is not the reasons to be going up there and eradicating about hundreds, when firstly he's saying drought, he's saying cats, he's saying everything else but the sheep. And that's the data I'm looking at with you, and I commend you on the 25 years, because it's, it's, it's a lot of years of research. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, how, to, how to sort this out. Um, my research really did not involve sheep. I mean, I, I did not in, I did not do research on sheep impacts, except in an indirect way, in terms of sheep impacts on the vegetation. But it was not a sheep study. I've never done a sheep study. I think the point you make is very important. It's mm -hmm. those other guys who have done that. And the purpose, I think, of their research was to show that there was major impact. At, at least my understanding of the research. Well, their, their research focused on what is the impact of right. sheep. Right, and, and yeah. they, they were looking at eradicating goats and sheep mm -hmm. in the national parks. I think those are the studies. Well, I, I'm not sure where the national park comes into this, right. frankly, but you know, in terms of Mauna Kea and, and Palila. Well, I think the studies that For were sure, done, the park was involved in, right. in, in eradicating goats, yeah, for sure. Okay, so, yeah. you know, um, I, I found your presentation to be very uh, useful. So thank you. I'm, I'm glad. I, I got a question. Sure. This is Willie Joe. Sorry, Nani. No, no. <laughs> so, um, Okay, I, I, I understand you are doing the research on pretty much the bird itself. 
so that kind of takes me back to Ike's question as far as the management. So what do you, or do you know, I mean, what are, what are we actively doing to try and help besides getting rid of the sheep? What are we actively, is the state or any, I mean, who's trying to manage any of this? Or I, I, I'll characterize it, but I'm going to be very careful <laughs> as I characterize it because that's, that's their kuleana. Um, you know, I, I, if I was in the shoes of the managers, if I, if I was the manager sitting here right now, I would be telling you that I have dozens and dozens of species, endangered species, plants, birds, whatever, that I'm responsible for managing and saving. And I don't have a budget that can cover a fraction of it. And so I'm not trying to make excuses for anybody, but I'm just saying, mm -hmm. if that were me, if I was the manager, that's that would be my reality, because I know their budgets are not right, not able to. Well, to do I guess that just so. brings us to the point where, you know, again, I I commend you on 25 plus years of yeah. research on these on all of these things, but. I would think it's it would be kind of frustrating on your part too that you're you're watching these species decline and nobody's really honestly doing anything about it. Well, it, because they're yeah. not. No, that's right. I we mean, all know that. You can just say it. Yeah. <laughs> there's no management plan for anything. Well, so there are a lot of plans. Oh yeah. You know, but plans like good intentions are, are right. only as good as. Uh, as the paper they're on, uh, it's it, it is very frustrating. Um, I I learned from my dad though um, that if you're going to be in the endangered species business, this is this is what mm -hmm. it is. You know, it's it's mostly things going downhill, and very few opportunities to to get something going in the opposite direction. But it does happen. I mean, we, we see this with Nene, that after decades and decades, I, I'm not totally comfortable with that it's recovered, but it's like, well, it's way better right. than it was in the, in the 60s and 70s. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it is, it, I think it's frustrating for everybody because it's, I won't say it's a no-win situation because I think there could be some wins, but so far there's not been one Hawaiian bird that has been taken off the endangered species list. And, and right. that's for good reason, because they don't really, they shouldn't be taken off just yet. 